alliances or alliance formations with European powers. And with the demise of European powers and the emergence of the United States, so Turkish-American alliance was built upon the foundation of geography and ideological competition. So um, this wasn't a kind of imposition on Turkey that Turkey had to follow uh, a pro-American foreign policy, but rather the geographic necessities. So if you want to, for example, uh, compare that with Azerbaijan, I think a similar kind of dilemma, neighborhood problems, you know, with Azerbaijan and the fact that Azerbaijan uh, finds itself in that neighborhood requires a certain kind of foreign policy for Azerbaijan. I understand and sympathize with that. Um, but uh, what are the other I mean, uh, factors located in the material uh, you know, uh, context? Another factor is economic. You know, the country it does not have solid resources. Resource base of Turkey is quite weak. Energy resources. Uh, especially in comparison to, um, to, to Russia, in comparison to Iran, Turkey is a resource poor country. That requires Turkey to be a trading nation. And, you know, maybe a good comparison here will be Japan and, or South Korea. Uh, you know, being poor in resources, you need to export so that you can import those energy resources. And, uh, as a, as a trading nation, Turkish foreign policy needs to diversify itself, especially uh, after the Cold War. We see this diversification of foreign, uh, Turkish foreign policy in many different areas. Right? So, um, the airport is an important, of course, source for Turkey to import those energy resources, as well as to export uh, goods. Europe. Uh, Europe was, was always an important source uh, for, uh, uh, for Turkish export and imports. Okay, so Turkey had to be a trading nation, cannot be isolated from the international economy, cannot be isolated from the international uh, marketplace, if, if you will. So in contrast, for example, with Iran. So if you want to you know, compare Turkey with, with Iran, Iran can afford isolation. You know, it is self-sufficient in many aspects. Turkey cannot afford isolation. It's a winter country, another factor, you know, in, in this. Uh, so two sources, uh, important sources of uh, natural gas. It's a winter country, basically means you need to, you know, uh, heat uh, households. Uh, and the basic heating, uh, you know, uh, resource, uh, heating uh, method is, uh, is natural gas today. In the last uh, 10 years, under the present government, uh, the number of Turkish cities with centralized uh, natural gas distribution has increased from uh, 2 or 3 to 68 today. And so 68 of Turkish cities have centralized uh, natural gas distribution. That means we don't need to buy, you know, as we used to do in our childhood and wait in the queues, uh, you know, these uh, tanks. Uh, you know, it comes directly. But it comes at a cost, at a cost not only for household, but at a cost for foreign policy as well, because it's all imports, import, uh, uh, imported uh, uh, resource. 68% of Turkish natural gas import come from Russia, about 25% come from Iran. So two of the uh, contenders for regional influence for Turkey also happen to be the source of natural gas. Okay? This, of course, makes uh, countries such as Azerbaijan very important for Turkish strategic calculations in the Nabucco, you know, context. I'm sure there will be some talk about that. Um, and, uh, but there is no alternative to this, you know. So in the case of Syrian crisis that I will be talking uh, later, uh, we have a dilemma here that Turkey needs to exert itself as a strong country, you know, power in, the, in Syrian politics, but at the same time, the other opposing powers are the countries that Turkey needs for its national gas, uh, you know, uh, supply. Okay, so uh, all of this material context and of the population boom in Turkey. Turkish population has increased rapidly in 1920 when the republic was established. Turkish population in the entire country was only 12 million people. Today we are approaching 80 million in number. So uh, these, uh, of course, people, uh, in the absence of solid economic uh, grants, uh, need jobs. 
so there is a diversification of Turkish uh, uh, economic sector from being an agriculture-based economy to uh, a, a heavy industry country. But m much of this heavy industry, as you can also notice in the streets, are uh, are international investments in Turkey. We don't have a national car brand, for example. Uh, all of the cars that you will see in the streets are investments. They are produced in Turkey mostly, but there are investments from Europe, from, from Japan, etc. So these investments need to come to the country. That means uh, also that isolation is not possible uh, for, for Turkey. It needs to be an active participant in international economy, a stable uh, uh, political system, uh, etc. Um, but on the other side, you know, all of these material factors require a certain uh, kind of foreign policy. On the other side, we have the ideational background. In the ideational background, we include factors such as, uh, such as identity. You know, what is the identity for Turkey? And what's the role of identity? What is the, what is the influence of identity in, in, in terms of determining a certain kind of foreign policy? Orientation. Uh, religion. You know, what is the role uh, of religion in, in foreign policy? That's actually asked in many uh, places. But of course, religion, if you, if you, even if, if you want to suppress religious identity locally, somebody else may not suppress that religious identity. I'm referring here to the European, European, European mem membership contact, uh, process, that we see religion as being played out against Turkey, that Turkey is of a different uh, religion, and therefore it cannot have mem you know, full membership in the European uh, Union because of this, uh, this, this factor. And the European uh, Union, of course, is an important uh, uh, area uh, for Turkish foreign policy, economically and politically. Uh, so, but if the membership is not possible in that direction, I think Muzaffer is going to talk about that. Uh, so what are other avenues for diversification? You know, so. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can you think historical memory as an important factor. Uh, maybe Russia may not look at Turkey uh, with a hostile you know, attitude, but in the historical consciousness of Turkey foreign policy makers, there is always a threat from, uh, from Russia. Iran is also like that. You know, Turkey is a secular country, does not play the role of, in the sectarian politics, especially in the polarization in the world today, in, the, in our neighborhood between the Sunni and Shia uh, you know, the camps. Uh, what is the position of Turkey? Uh, but again, this is being, uh, you know, I mean, this is being an issue independent of Turkey. That the neighborhood politics is being polarized in these in these terms. So uh, all of these, I mean, as a combination of these material context and the ideational context, at the juncture of these, we have the Turkish foreign policy, and any country in that sense is similar, you know, similar. Uh, influenced by these, uh, by these factors. Uh, traditionally, uh, Turkey was a pro-Western uh, and uh, uh, basically a pro-American uh, country, and in, in, in the foreign policy of Turkey was, was in that direction. Uh, but as, as I said, uh, the neighborhood uh, and, and, and the so membership process is being increasingly getting more uh, blurred, you know, blurring, and therefore, we need to uh, diversify Turkish foreign policy in different areas. But also globally speaking, the global uh, uh, power center of the world, let's say, is shifting from the West to Asia. And we, we see this, right? So well, one third of the entire world population live in two countries, in just two countries. Okay? That's the one third of the entire world population, China and India together. China will be number one economy in the world. Uh, followed by the United States, but followed by India rather than Europe. Okay? So we have this shift to, uh, if you will, this Pacific Asia, you know, from uh, that will include the United States, but the United States of that time, let's say, if you want to project this like, for the next uh, perhaps 30 years, in the next 30 years of the United States, will be a much different country from now. And uh, today the United States happens to have a president who won elections without the majority white uh, you know, vote base. So this is what I'm saying, an increasing diversification of US population. Okay? Perhaps Latin, uh, Latinization of the United States, Spanish uh, United States, basically. 
is becoming a reality of, uh, for, for Turkey to consider. And that also means Turkish Forum, another area for Turkish Forum policy is Latin America, terms of Brazil. Brazil uh, emerged as a basic partner for Turkey in many of uh, occasions, including Iran nuclear deal. Uh, Africa is another uh, area for Turkey to, uh, to seek uh, you know, influence and to, to diversify its interests. Okay, so uh, Middle East, especially after our spring, uh, is becoming uh, a, a, a zone of opportunity for Turkey. But East Asia as well. Okay? So uh, all of these global power dilemmas, global power realities, compel Turkey to diversify its foreign policy, to diversify its interests, uh, and come up with an approach that would fit the post cold War era better. Okay? So, um, and I would uh, actually end here, and then with, uh, with further more detailed discussions uh, in many of these areas of opportunities, uh, you know, we, I, we will have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, very good and interesting points. Uh, now we are going to talk about the uh, relations uh, of Turkey with uh, neighboring countries, neighboring countries, and let's uh, start the uh, talk. Dr. Chadash Ünger from Marmara University uh, will uh, talk about the Turkish foreign policy toward China. Uh, she graduated uh, from uh, Middle East Technical University uh, and she uh, studied in BD University of Turkey Cultural Studies program and she wrote the uh, master thesis about the impact of my
most, most of these, you know, most of the scholars and journalists, etc., they are using the term East Asia, which is, I believe, uh, is a more neutral category. So uh, this distance is not about geography, it's about culture, and during the Cold War it was, it also became more about ideology. So uh, and by the 1950s, of course, People's Republic of China was established in 1949, and uh, well, Turkey did not recognize China uh, until uh, 1971, and when you look at the 1950s, you see that uh, this ideological distance has been uh, really uh, pronounced. I mean, this is, this is a very important uh, part of China-Turkish relations, although state-level relations was non-existent. They all started in 1971, and even in 1971, it was just a political gesture because uh, Sino US rapprochement took place in the early 1970s, Nixon's visit to China, uh, and everything. Well, Kissinger's, uh, you know, Kissinger was the architect behind this ping pong diplomacy and uh, Sino US rapprochement. The basic idea was to counter the Soviet threat, and basically, Turkey follows suit. So, we didn't. Even at that time, even in 1971, uh, our prime minister, well, basically contested the idea that, you know, what are we doing recognizing China? What, is the, what good comes out of it, uh, etc. So this was just a political gesture that we did because we have been following uh, the U.S. lean in foreign policy since, uh, since the 1950s during the Democratic, the Democratic Party governments uh, in Turkey uh, in, in that decade of 1950s. And, well, what kind of contact did we have with China? Well, the Korean War. We, we basically uh, were on the battlefield. I mean, Turkish soldiers and Chinese soldiers basically engaged in conflict uh, in, in, in the Korean War. This was also something that uh, Turkey did because, it, of course, the Democratic Party was very much uh, an anti-communist uh, government. They, they sincerely believed in the you know, idea of you know, containing China, North Korea, and whatever communist countries you had in the neighborhood, in Asia, in, in Africa, etc. But also, well, it made us to, it enabled us to join NATO uh, in 1952. Uh, and we have this NATO membership, of course, solidified Turkey's uh, geopolitical position during the Cold War, and it has remained so, although Turkey had many differences with the US uh, in, the, in the late, starting in the late. 1960s and especially with the Cyprus conflict. Uh, well, we have remained in NATO and Turkey uh, up until the end of the Cold War was a very much uh, pro-US, pro-Western uh, country. Uh, well, the, there are some important events, although I hardly doubt that they were landmark changes. Well, Mao Zedong uh, thought, or Maoism was uh, popular, became popular uh, in, in Turkey during the 1960s uh, among you know, certain left-wing uh, groups. So we can say we can say that well, although despite the lack of uh, state-level exchanges, uh, Turkish and Chinese people, I mean, they were uh, getting to know. I mean, uh, at least the Turkish people were learning about China, mostly through mass media, which was highly, uh, you know prejudicial or use a very, you know, pronounced anti-communist discourse, but also uh, they were uh, learning it from alternative sources. And Radio Peking uh, started broadcasting to Turkey in 1957 and continued up to today. So uh, we believe that uh, some people were hearing about China through their direct uh, broadcasts. But, Mostly, uh, even after the recognition of China in 1971, nothing happened. 1970s are mostly lost years in terms of Chinese-Turkish relations, uh, in terms of state-level exchanges or other types of you know, economic exchanges, etc. So uh, nothing much happened up until the 1980s. Well, what happened in the 1980s? Well, both, although China and Turkey, of course, had totally different regimes and they were coming from totally different cultural and ideological backgrounds, well, we see that similar changes have happened in, in Turkey and China. Uh, well, Turkey's all government here, and Deng Xiaoping government there. Uh, privatization became important. Export-oriented growth became important. We can we can safely say that you know both Turkey and China went through enormous changes uh, during this period. Although Turkey has been a capitalist country, I mean, 
average people, public at large, uh, did not really experience those changes up until the 1980s. Uh, there were so many progressive changes in this uh, period. And this export-oriented growth and uh, you know, basically trade becoming uh, so much more important uh, in both Turkey and China, uh, we see that there is a shift of emphasis towards economic relations with China. And we see the first significant state-level visits, and Ken Ebran's visits, President Ebran's visits to China, I believe in 1982, and Kunduz also visited China, and there were exchanges. I mean, Chinese officials, high-level officials also visited, started to visit uh, Turkey uh, in, during this time. And when we come to the 1990s, uh, we see mostly because of the you know, Chinese opening up reforms uh, they paid off in China and in China increasingly became, uh, well, a, a major trading uh, country uh, during the 1990s and Turkish-Chinese relations basically ever since the 1990s have been uh, increasingly focused on, I mean, the, the economic dynamics became so much important in terms of shaping the rest of the relationship. I mean, state level exchanges basically were motivated, even today, they are basically motivated by private sector initiatives because uh, we are consuming so many uh, Chinese products because we are buying so much from, from China. Uh, and I don't believe this to be a product of a systematic foreign policy on the part of China, even today. I mean, even after the landmark changes, paradigm shift in Turkey's foreign policy, I don't believe that uh, we are doing enough in order to turn this wave, uh, you know, towards ourselves to, to our benefit, and I'll come to that later. But uh, in the 1990s, basically, economic relations, trade, bilateral trade, picks up, and there's one, of course, in the political sense, there's a uh, there's a drawback in, in Chinese Turkish relations, which became much more important during the 1990s. Uh, the Uyghur people, uh, the Muslim Turks, Turkic people uh, living in the autonomous Xinjiang province, they, uh, well, ever since the 1950s, they have been immigrating to Turkey because of the, you know, several kinds of, you know, discrimination or repressions they were uh, suffering in, in China. Well, they, they have been here, they have been coming here ever since the 1950s, but in the 1990s, you see uh, this, you know, separatist movement in, in the Xinjiang province uh, going a little bit wild, and uh, well, there are certain organizations built, and there are some violent uh, skirmishes in China uh, during this period. So China is growing increasingly anxious about the Turkish support for these groups, uh, public support as well as you know state level uh, officials. Some of you may know that you know high level uh, people, high level officials in Turkey uh, were having conversations with these you know uh, diaspora leaders. I mean members of the uh, Turkey diaspora in Turkey. Uh, those who advocated all these you know, radical sentiments about uh, China, the separatist agenda, etc. Up until the late 1990s, they were getting, uh, well, official recognition from, uh, from the Turkish leaders. What we did, I mean, how economic relations changed this by the, end, by the end of the 1990s is that, well, Turkish side had to uh, be much more attentive to Chinese uh, demands. Area and by ever since the 1990s, uh, we have been denouncing uh, that you know Turkey officially supports any of these groups, uh, any of the separatist agenda, uh, or pro independence movements in, in Xinjiang uh, province. But although I mean this problem, of course, lingers uh, even even after today. I mean the, the most recent crisis we had was in 2009. And uh, our prime minister basically defined whatever was happening in China as, as an almost genocide or something like a genocide. So, well, it, it got tense all of a sudden, although in 2010, again, the bilateral relations picked up. But I, I believe, even though it's going nice right now, that this, you know, uh, lingers, this remains as a fundamental problem area between Turkey and uh, China, and it is because uh, the, the public opinion, in a sense, is basically um, determined or very much influenced by the Uyghur diaspora in Turkey. And we don't have so many China experts, and we don't have people speaking Chinese, traveling to Chinese. We have, of course, businessmen, but we don't have so many scholars. We don't have so many journalists. We don't have people residing in China to go and observe these events. So we're either 
getting everything from uh, Western uh, news sources or uh, you know in, in, in this huge gray area that you know Turkish statesmen uh, or Turkish people at large are you know not able to grasp whatever is going on in China. Well, the Uyghur diaspora takes the lead, and then uh, they are on TV and they are telling us whatever is happening and in China. And obviously, they have a rather biased opinion. I'm not saying that human, there's no human rights issues in Xinjiang province, but the ideas that we are hearing on TV, in a sense, is quite biased uh, and, and, and radical. So uh, this problem lingers on, but the fundamental landmark change happened, that happened in, in Chinese Turkish relations. Uh, some numbers can provide an example. Uh, in 2000, Turkey and China had one billion dollars of uh, bilateral trade uh, volume, and today, as of today, we have 24 billion dollars of uh, U.S. dollars of uh, trade volume. So this is a very of course, uh, this is not a gradual change, this is a landmark event, I, I believe. And the, the main, main problem here, I mean, this is mostly when we're talking about Turkish foreign policy regarding East Asia, and we're talking about Turkish foreign policy towards China, we are basically, I mean, most of these optimistic scholars pick on, for instance, the increasing level of state exchanges, state level exchanges, and also the growing bilateral trade volume. But the fact is that we are basically selling one to China and we are buying nine. So it's nine times and they are selling us more, like nine times more than we sell them. And this has, this did not change against government policy. Ever since the late 1990s, Turkish governments have been fighting this you know, trade deficit, but they were not able to, uh, you know, counter it. We, we took some precautions in the, in the, in the mid, uh, you know, in, in 2004 and 2005, that was the Stalin declaration, together with you know American uh, American merchants and you know uh, from several other developing countries, uh, we have instituted certain quotas, certain restrictions on Chinese products. But the overall trend was irreversible. Some of that is because of global changes, of course. I mean, China is basically uh, in almost every country you have a trade deficit vis-à-vis -vis China. But some of it. I believe is very much, uh, very much uh, determined by the fact that Chinese businessmen still see China as a distant land, and because we have this linguistic deficiency, because we have a certain cultural biases, ideological biases, whatever, uh, basically they are not able to, they have not been able to change anything or boost uh, the, the uh, trade relations on. But maybe well, one to nine is a is a rather big gap. So you, you need to do something uh, about it. Uh, so basically, do I have time? Okay. Okay. So um, basically, there is this landmark. I mean, the increased state level exchange. Of course, they were uh, during the justice and development government. Uh, we have seen the increased contact with. Time. State level exchanges, high level visits. I can give many examples from Abu Lakri's visit uh, in, in 2009 to, well, Taif Erdogan's most recent visit in 2012, but also the Chinese side are also, uh, you know, paying much more attention to Turkey in a sense. Uh, so lots of treaties have been signed, and one, the most important perhaps is uh, the Strategic Partnership Treaty, which is signed in 2010, and this aims to bring the Chinese Turkish relations to 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 the to a level where you know political and cultural exchanges will be as much important as you know economic uh, relations because economic ties they're already growing and well although Turkey is on the uh, losing side in, in in that well Chinese products are also uh, let me emphasize this because this is not a totally negative picture Chinese products are making poor people much more you know, uh, comfortable in terms of it, it increases their consumption uh, uh, level and uh, it basically has uh, a positive influence on the inflation, overall inflation figures. So it's not all bad, but anyway, private sector is also already doing this. And what can the governments do? Well, they sign bilateral agreements uh, and they, they make so many deals on, on the energy sector, energy, uh, well, nuclear energy, but also 
or wind power, you know, green uh, energy technologies. Uh, other than that, well, Turkish side has been very much attentive to the Chinese tourists, this Chinese middle middle income or middle class people. Uh, Turkish presidents have been inviting Chinese tourists, encouraging Chinese tourists to visit Turkey, uh, and there there's been some progress in that. One of the latest uh, numbers I think is that. 9,000 Chinese people, uh, tourists, have been in Turkey most recently. Uh, what else? Well, political sense. Of course, there's always talk about, you know, making a political deal with China, politically strategic, uh, you know, uh, uh, some kind of cooperation uh, with, with China. I think this is uh, problematic. I mean, this is, of course, Chinese side and Turkey side have been emphasizing this. But the most recent, there are so many forms in, in Chinese Turkish relations. I mean, uh, well, Turkey, yes, we have a much more multi dimensional policy. Yes, there has been a dramatic change, but we're still a NATO member. I mean, Turkey is still a NATO member, and well, uh, China is leading this Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is, uh, well, which is totally anti NATO, uh, if you. You, know, you, you might disagree on this. They are not very influential, but geopolitically speaking, well, China is uh, not very much, uh, you know, they, they, they have not been so much, uh, they have never encouraged any NATO action, or they have been totally uncomfortable with what the United States is doing in Asia, Pacific region, including Central Asia states, etc. So, uh, the Arab Spring, the, 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 what Turkey says on Syria and what Chinese side says on Syria, in, including the recent veto, I mean, in terms of uh, taking more connection, um, and Turkey was supporting this UN deal, and China, of course, opposed this. And this is only an example, I'm just mentioning this because this is the most recent example, but such and such, I mean, this all looks good on paper, the strategic partnership, political cooperation, etc., but when it comes to you know, concrete things, uh, something important, something regionally or globally significant, well, China and Turkey falls apart. So, my understanding of Chinese Turkish relations is that, well, the private sector will lead this initiative. Of course, we will uh, buy more from China, maybe sell more to China, but politically, I don't think uh, much of a progress will, will come out of, uh, you know, from, from East Asia as compared to, for instance, Japan and South Korea, which have been, you know, allies to Turkey or you know, partners to Turkey uh, ever since uh, the Cold War. So I'll end up here. If you have questions, I will continue it. Thank you for your speech. Actually, after all uh, speech, uh, we will have time uh, for questions. Uh, now uh, let's turn to Russia, uh, the Russian Turkish relations. Uh, we have. Speaker from Marmara University, Emre Ershen. Uh, he graduated from uh, Marmara University, uh, Political Science and International Relations Department. He wrote uh, his thesis on Russian Judaism and uh, its impact on Turkish Russian relations in the post Cold War period. And uh, uh, he has uh, published extensively on this issue and I presented several papers in conferences in Turkey and the world. Uh, his forthcoming article uh, titled The Evolution of Eurasia as a Geopolitical Concept in Post-Cold War Turkey is going to be published in the Journal of Geopolitics. Uh, and after your speech, we will have five minutes break. Uh, uh, thank you, and thank you organizers uh, once again uh, for giving us the opportunity to share our ideas and our vision about Turkish foreign policy today. I also have a PowerPoint presentation, uh, but I'm not sure if you'll be able to see that. Yeah. If you can just click on it to see if it's possible uh, to make things a bit more visual for you and to, to, to have you Maybe it might be easier for you to follow what I'm going to say today. Uh, well, because my focus today will be uh, on the post Cold War period, maybe, and I want to give uh, an insight about Turkey's relations with Russia, especially in the post Cold War period. 
But on my channel, of course, Russia is Turkey's neighbor. And uh, I don't mean the common land borders. We don't have any common land borders with Russia. But if you take a look at the Caucasus, where we have uh, land borders with Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia, you see that there, uh, Russia is a very important player. But apart from that, also historically, we see that Russia uh, has always been a very important neighboring country for Turkey for various reasons. Well, first of all, we have uh, all, more than 500 years of diplomatic relations with Russia, and that diplomacy most of the time includes enmity and rivalry rather than cooperation and friendship, unfortunately. And we see that the two empires, the Ottoman Empire and the Russian Empire, have fought many wars between 17th and 19th centuries, and uh, we can call Russia, in that sense, uh, the major nemesis of the Ottoman Empire, because that was the case when we take a look at the 19th century, especially. Um, well, the uh, First World War, of course, changed a lot of things, and during the interwar period, we see that Turkey and the Soviet Union enjoyed close relations with each other, uh, and they were both opposed to uh, the West, in a sense. Turkey was going through a national movement, a uh, independence movement, whereas Russia at the time was leading the communist uh, system. Therefore, uh, it was a good time for Turkish-Russian relations, but uh, all of a sudden it ended with the eruption of the Second World War, the Second World War, sorry, and uh, we see that Stalin started to make requests, territorial requests from Turkey, and that was the end of the cooperation period. And during the Cold War, we see that the two countries didn't really have much of a contact with each other due to the fact that they were included in opposite ideological camps. Turkey was in the Western uh, bloc, uh, it entered NATO in 1952, and uh, Russia was, of course, uh, the leading member of the Soviet bloc, uh, as we suggest. So, uh, the end of the Cold War, in this sense, changed a lot of things for Russia, both in the positive and negative ways. And uh, during the 1990s, unfortunately, there was this notion of geopolitical rivalry between the two countries, mainly over the South Caucasus, Black Sea, Central Asia, wherever we take a look at the former Soviet space, we see that the two countries have been actually regarded as <coughs> geopolitical rivals. So today, my focus will be on the 2000s actually, and we'll be seeing they're already past there, so my, my, Okay, so uh, they will be uh, taking a look at the Turkish Russian relations in the 1990s in a minute. But uh, like I said, um, in, in the 2000s, the relations between the two countries have continuously improved not only in terms of uh, cooperation in areas such as trade and energy, which might be regarded as a bit more technical, but also regarding their dialogue and major regional and global political issues. And the improvement of relations between the two countries was so remarkable in the 2000s that some people in Turkey and Russia have started to name it as the formation of a new strategic axis in Eurasia. Well, I think the term strategic today can be a little too ambitious for labeling Turkish-Russian relations, but we can still claim that the positive course in Turkish-Russian relations throughout the 2000s especially uh, gradually replaced the geopolitical rivalry of the 1990s uh, that you see in the slide. And uh, that notion, of course, portrayed the two countries as chief competitors for political and economic influence uh, over the South Caucasus and Central Asia. So in this presentation, I will try to reveal and analyze the major factors behind this positive change in Turkish-Russian relations in the 2000s. And my main argument here is that the rapprochement between Turkey and Russia can best be analyzed with respect to developments in three spheres, bilateral, regional, and global. Uh, Okay. Uh, but since we're talking about a positive change, I think we first need to have an overview of Turkish-Russian relations in the 1990s in order to understand what has changed in the 2000s. Well, regarding the 1990s, we can easily say that Turkish-Russian relations during this period tried to overcome particularly one major dilemma, and that was, of course, reconciling geopolitical competition with economic cooperation. On the one hand, Ankara and Moscow viewed each other as serious rivals in the so-called New Great Game for political and economic influence over the former Soviet republics. On the other hand, they also anticipated the importance of their economic ties, which have especially become much stronger after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And this dilemma seems to have shaped the course of Turkish-Russian relations, particularly in the 1993-1997 period, when a number of problems have frequently caused political crisis between the two countries, despite the maintenance of impressive figures in trade and other economic spheres. 
As you can also see here, most of the problems that emerged between Turkey and Russia in the 1990s were related with their competition for sphere of influence in the South Caucasus, Central Asia, the Caspian, and Black Sea regions. On the other hand, we see an opposite trend uh, in the economic sphere, fostering stronger cooperation between the two countries. And you can easily see this trend in the figures in bilateral trade and tourism especially. In 1997, the initiation of the Blue Stream natural gas pipeline has also added a strong energy dimension to the picture. And if it has not been for these economic links, I believe Turkish-Russian relations could have faced more serious flaws due to uh, political issues. But the economic dimension of the relations uh, forced both countries to keep their geopolitical competition at least on a manageable level. And this became increasingly evident after 1999 when Vladimir Putin became, uh, came into power in Russia. And during Putin's leadership, Turkish-Russian relations started to enjoy their best times ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And in November 2001, the relations between the two countries was even elevated to the level of multi-dimensional partnership. The emergence of such uh, an optimistic period in Turkish-Russian relations was of course based on pragmatism. And during this period, the two countries seemed to have pushed aside the problematic political issues and preferred to proceed with increasing cooperation in issues such as energy, trade, and other technical matters. And this can also be seen in the agenda of the high-level visits which took place between Turkey and Russia uh, in the beginning of 2000s. Well, although it is true that economic issues dominated the agenda of the Turkish-Russian relations, we should not also overlook the two countries' search for a new dialogue in their policies towards the South, South Caucasus and Central Asia either. And I believe this is this, it is this search that distinguishes the 2000s from 1990s. This was symbolized by new regional cooperation projects such as the Caucasus Stability Pact, Moscow Ankara Central Asia Strategic Triangle and Black Sea Ford. And most importantly, of course, the action plan for cooperation in Eurasia, which institutionalized the regional political cooperation between Turkey and Russia in the post-September 11 period. The regional dimension of the Turkish-Russian uh, relations was not only limited with the former Soviet space, the force of Turkey's relations with the European Union has especially been influential in pushing